Uh, we started this cycle, cycle um, <clears throat> 10 yesterday. And yesterday morning before, the, before I did the first class, I decided to sort of change, change my plans for the next uh, couple of cycles. Uh, so the main, the main effect of this change on you is that I don't have things worked out for next week yet which means there's no way for you to prepare yet, so there won't be any GSA <laughs> this weekend. So there's, there's no GSA this weekend. There may be something to read or something, but there'll be no GSA, no quiz this weekend. Um, next weekend is a long weekend, right? No one wants to work on a long weekend. No GSAs next weekend either. The weekend after that is the last weekend of the term. No one wants to work on the weekend of the weekend of term. <laughs> that GSA stuff is done for the year. Quizzes are done. We're just not doing that anymore. I don't, again, I'm not just certain what we're going to do on MindTap and so on, so just watch for instructions, but I want to change things up in ways that I still have to just get the details uh, figured out. Um, there's a few of you on count to. I don't have a count to question today for a poll, but I'm happy to keep my eye on it if you have questions that you want to post there. Today, today I'd like to begin our look at DNA technologies of various kinds, like you are doing in session B of the last module. It's, it's the last of like everything this time of year, right? It's the last time you'll do lots of things as first year students. So that's kind of exciting. Um, before we get into DNA tech, I need to finish up a couple of uh, concepts from, from the cancer piece. And that, so these rates are pretty high, right? We, got, we, we essentially have a, a one-third chance of dying from cancer in our society. And uh, these, these big four, again, give us some clue as to what the underlying causes are. We have a pretty good idea of what cancer looks like. We have an idea of what the cells are doing. But we're not doing a spectacular job of figuring out why they're doing it or how to get them to stop doing it. And one of the reasons is they're just doing regular thing. They're just dividing. That's what cells are supposed to do because they need to be able to divide like crazy during embryonic stages, but then they need to stop. And we have a pretty good idea of what the mechanics are of the cell cycle and what's driving that and what the components are. But we're discovering that it's just, there's something fundamental we still don't understand. We have been able to sort out these, the, the mutations seem important in some way. Mutations are important in some way, and in, in particular, these three kinds of genes seem to be important if they get mutated. Genes that, that regulate growth and survival, genes that regulate keeping the, the genome intact, so DNA repair enzymes. And then this, this bottom one I skipped over in the last class, cell fate. This is a little tricky to explain, but I think you get the idea. If you imagine yourself as a newly fertilized zygote, you've got all those good mRNAs and proteins and organelles from your mom, You've got DNA from mom and dad, and then you start to divide. At that stage, when you're just one cell or two cells, those cells can be anything. Their fate is wide open. Those cells know how to make liver, they know how to make skin, they know how to make everything. But as they divide, two, four, eight, 
100, 200, 1,000 cells, they begin to differentiate. They begin to restrict their fate so that at some point a given cell can't be anything. It can only be blood. Now it could be red cells or white cells, but it's going to be blood. But then a little bit later, a cell can only be white cells. So you see what I mean. It goes from a nucleus being able to be anything to only blood, to only white blood cells. That's the process of differentiation. It's the first idea. So when I talk about cell fate, that's really what I'm talking about, differentiated cells. Now, <clears throat> I think you understand that cells differentiate as a result of gene expression. In fact, they differentiate as a result of thousands of genes being expressed or not. And their products interacting in a network. So that's a very important idea. The fate of a given cell is determined by the network of gene expression that is happening at that time. And here's the most important part. The network of gene expression that's happening right now at this time was determined by the network of gene expression one minute ago. And that one was be determined by the network a minute before that. So each network of gene expression creates the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So let's just put all that together. A fertilized zygote creates a network of gene expression that determines what the next network will be, that determines what the next network will be, and that is the process of differentiation. People try to represent this graphically with this kind of picture. So just kind of stay with me here. This landscape, this is a developmental landscape. It's like a graph. And each of these intersection points on the graph is a particular network. Each of the intersection points on the graph is a particular network. So another way to think of it is, each particular network puts you somewhere on this developmental landscape. So let's start at the start. Just watch me here. A fertilized zygote, again, that nucleus can be anything. And then the network, this complex network, sets a developmental path. The next network, the next network, the next one, the next one the next one, and all the way to a mature cell type, all the way to a liver cell. And that's very stable. Those networks are very stable. Um, another nucleus might go this other way, and it would become the lens of your eye. Again, a stable final cell type. Look at this red part. The red part is a potentially available cell fate. It's on the landscape. There are networks that would give you that red cell type. It's just they're not normally used in development. They're not normally used because that's a cancer cell type. Certain networks can lead to cancer cell types, but those networks are not usually used. You can think of it as a barrier there, as a, there's a hill in the landscape. And that hill results from gene expression of, let's say, tumor suppressor genes. Tum the expression of tumor suppressor genes creates a network that prevents 
nuclei from falling into the cancer cell type, the cancer fate. But if a genetic change, if a mutation, or even an epigenetic change happens, if that tumor suppressor gene is knocked down by mutation or by epigenetic regulation, then perhaps that hill will disappear. Perhaps that barrier will disappear and the nucleus will tip into the cell type, the cancer cell type. This is, this is crazy upper year stuff. I just want to really help you get the idea that cancer is just an alternative cell type. Alternative cell type that a cell might arrive there as a result of these very complex networks of gene expression. And certainly, many genes affect these barriers. And if those genes are mutated, then a cell might change its fate and become a tumor cell instead of a normal cell. OK, nice. One of the ways that we affect these networks is by epigenetic methylation of genes, turn them on and off over the course of your lifetime. Um, another way, of course, that the networks are modified is by this balance. Your cells divide under control because they're responding to the presence of proto-oncogenes at the right amount balanced with tumor suppressor genes at the right amount. So I want you to get that idea. Normal cell division results from the balance of expression of these proto-oncogenes, which are trying to stimulate cell division, and the tumor suppressor genes, which are supposed to restrict cell division. And of course, it isn't only protein coding genes that are important here. Not only tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes, but microRNAs are also very, very important in differentiation. Which sort of brings us to where we left off the previous class. What's going on here? HPV is a DNA virus, sexually transmitted DNA virus, but it doesn't normally go into your chromosomes. Few viruses actually get into your genome. Many people think all viruses do that. Absolutely not. Few viruses actually get into your genome. If you search the literature very carefully, you can find some examples of HPV in people's genomes. But that seems to be a mistake. In, you, in general, HPV does not infect your genome. So then, how is it causing cancer? How might it be causing cancer? I don't care about the right answer. I don't care if you've looked up the right answer or not. But what might it be doing? What might a virus do to cause cancer without causing mutations? Anybody? What might they do? Yes. Maybe this virus is able to down-regulate tumor suppressor genes, like p53. Maybe we can down-regulate p53. Nice. Yes? Maybe that virus, beautiful, maybe that virus affects the network in such a way that the cell can now fall into that cancer fate. Yes, the virus could disturb the network of gene products such that the cell could then fall into a cancer fate. Keep going. This is the creative thinking exercises you've been, you've been doing. Like, what might, what might it do? It's another idea. What might a virus do to cause cancer without causing mutations? What? 
Yeah, yeah. Over the the so maybe it brings some gene to the host cell and overexpresses that gene that stimulates cell division. Maybe it brings its own CDK. I'd like you to try to be as specific as possible. Oh, the virus might stimulate the cell to divide. That's a good answer for grade 12. For here, I'm looking for something a little more specific. But yeah, so maybe it brings its own CDK. Great, so you, you have the idea. The virus would need to upset that balance somehow. And I think you can, you can think of some good ideas, and you can trade those ideas with your friends in order to make sort of you, then you have a hypothesis. And then you can test that by experiment. And that's how science works. All right. So I want to leave now the sort of applied regulation in development and um, in cancer and move to DNA tech. Even though, even though it's clear from our inability to win the war on cancer, like we're not winning that, even though we're clearly we don't understand life well enough to make strong advances against those diseases, even though we don't feel like we're that smart, we do feel like somehow we're smart enough to mess with genes and to mess with the genomes of organisms and move genes around and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So we do have that ability. We can move genes essentially from any organism to any other and get expression. And if you have that ability, of course, the first thing you think of, the thing you want to make most of all, the thing the world needs most of all, is a remote control rat. A rat that you can control with a joystick. You can look this up on YouTube. There, this is a rat that goes forward, goes right, goes left, goes back at the control of a joystick because it has this little LED light sitting in its brain and the light is controlling the brain of this living, behaving animal. We can control the behavior of an animal with a joystick. This is a technology called optogenetics. It is simultaneously friggin' amazing and pretty frightening. You could imagine waking up sometime, let's say when you're 50, and your leg is kind of sore, so you shine a little bit of light on a sensor that's implanted in your skull, and that fires neurons in your brain and takes your pain away. Ah, this is crazy stuff. But how do you do it? Um, if you're going to mess with neurons, then of course what you're messing with is the polarization and depolarization of neurons. Um, positive charges, you remember how this works from high school, positive charges outside, negative charges inside, polarizes um, nerve axons, and then the nerve signal is sent along this <clears throat> fiber as a wave of depolarization, as a wave of positive charges flooding into, this, into the uh, cell. So we can get control of this. We can get control of the depolarization of neurons by inserting, inserting channel rhodopsin from clammy. Channel rhodopsin is a channel. And it opens when you flash blue light on it. So that's what they've done. Take channel rhodopsin from clammy, put it into rat neurons, and then shine lights on them. 
and the neurons depolarize, and the rat turns left. How do you do that? Like, where do you get the gene from? Where do you get the, where do you get the channel rhodopsin from? Well, from clammy. So we, we could take the clammy nuclear genome and chop it up. Take the clammy nuclear genome and chop it up with restriction endonucleases. You've seen these in, um, in the lab. This particular one, echo R1, makes the staggered cut at that specific site in double-stranded DNA. So if we cut this DNA and if we cut the clammy DNA, then we can stick them together. We can make this recombinant DNA molecule that contains the clammy channel rhodopsin gene. I don't know how much of this is review for you or how much of it is cryptic, so again, don't hesitate to ask a question or shoot me something on the back channel. Um, so this is classic recombinant DNA from the 70s. I mean, when I was you, this was big stuff that you could combine DNA together and put it into cells. That was scaring the hell out of everyone. And now first-year students are doing it um, in their bio labs. Another source, another possible source of the gene is mRNA from clammy. We extract the mRNA, the mature mRNA from clammy, and then we reverse transcribe that into double-stranded DNA. This is a kind of DNA called cDNA, or complementary DNA. Reverse transcription to make double-stranded you should think about and argue with your friends about how the cDNA version of channel rhodopsin would be different from the genomic version. How is the cDNA version of channel rhodopsin different from just chopping up the genome? But now, a third way is you can just type it. Type the sequence into your computer, and a gene printer will create the sequence for you. You don't have to grow clammy. You don't have to have all that crap in your lab. You can just sit down and type the sequence. Now, to be fair, right now these machines can't do the whole channel rhodopsin gene, but they can do a lot. And by the time you are PhD students, I'm pretty sure you'll be able to type a gene. OK? So genomic, genomic, cDNA, or DNA synthesis, three sources of the gene if you want to make these crazy transgenic organisms. So. Now I want to just broaden a little bit. The next few slides are not specifically about how to make an optorat, just in general. How do, you get, how do you get genes into other organisms? And you've already been doing this, or you will soon, um, by working with plasmids. You've been making restriction digests of plasmids and so on. So you understand, you could take a plasmid and cut it with a restriction enzyme, again, insert the genomic fragments, and then put those into bacteria by transformation. This is what you've been doing in the lab. So transformation is the process whereby cells take up plasmids. Uh, Dennis also talked about electroporation. That's just fancy transformation, getting cells to take up DNA from the environment. And then you can grow these cells in a culture. And of course, every time a cell divides, you get more plasmid, you get more of your gene of choice. So this is a way to grow up lots of copies of the gene of choice. But 
I mean, often you want that gene to be expressed, not just copied. So you don't use just any old vector, not any old plasmid. You use an expression vector. And vector is just a term for kind of a vehicle for moving DNA into cells. So look, this expression vector has a promoter, a transcription terminator, an SD box, all the things you would imagine would be necessary for getting expression in a bacterium. So you just cut the plasmid at these restriction sites, insert your DNA of choice, and then offer that to a bacterium. And then you should be able to get expression of that gene. You then get expression of that gene in a bacterial cell. You get expression of a eukaryotic protein in a bacterial cell. This was one of the first amazing triumphs of genetic engineering, getting bacteria to produce human insulin. Getting bacteria to produce a human protein was one of the first successes of classic genetic engineering. And you've already know and you've already thought about how these genes might need to be changed when they move from eukaryotes to prokaryotes and back and forth. We talked a lot about the different signals that would be in there, which ones would be recognized, which ones not, and so on. I'm not, I'm not going to go back, back over that. Now, just as a little aside, we also want to transform plants. We, we want to get DNA into plants. So what people figured out years ago is you can do that with a gun. You can shoot them. You can shoot little tiny gold pellets into plants. The pellets are coated in DNA and that will deliver your DNA into the cells and not only the cells but even right into the chloroplasts. So this is astonishing. You can move DNA right into the chloroplasts of cells using this gene gun. But long before humans thought of guns, nature had this figured out by an organism called rhizobium, um, an organism that you may have first met called agrobacterium now been reclassified as rhizobium. And rhizobium has the astonishing ability to move genes from a bacterium into the nucleus of a plant. It moves genes from a bacterial cell into the nucleus of a host plant. Natural genetic engineering as a result of this vector called the TI plasmid TI refers to tumor inducing. Tumor inducing. So what we've been able to do is of course just substitute that tDNA for our own DNA. If you wanted tobacco plants to produce um, EGF, epidermal growth factor, Let's say we need epidermal growth factor to treat uh, burn patients. But we need to get a lot of it. Well, one way we might get a lot of epidermal growth factor is to get tobacco plants to produce that human protein. And we could use the TI plasmid to get the EGF gene into the nucleus of the plant cells. That's been done. I don't know if it's been done with EGF, but it's been done. There are many acres and acres and acres of plants in the world being grown from which we can harvest pharmaceutical proteins. That industry is called farming with a pH, producing crops that are 
pharmacologically valuable. Another kind of vector, not surprisingly, are viruses. Those viruses like adenovirus that do go right into your nucleus, well, they could be used as vehicles to deliver genes and have been. So some viruses, we can take out viral genes, put in the gene of choice, and then let the virus deliver that gene into host cells. Viruses have been successful vectors, not so successful in gene therapy for humans. We've been trying to cure CF and, and other kinds of diseases using viruses, and it's, it's not been wildly successful yet. But another way is just squirt the DNA in with a needle. So this is a fertilized mouse zygote here. And a very, very fine needle can be used to literally just inject DNA, a DNA vector, into the nucleus of this fertilized egg. The baby mouse then will incorporate that DNA <clears throat> and be transgenic. Okay. Here's another way to make a transgenic mouse. It's just a little bit more complicated. It's got a couple of steps. First one is you have a mouse embryo, a mouse embryo, and you take cells from a mouse embryo and you grow them in, a cu in culture. You have been growing bacteria in culture, but it's also possible to just grow your own cells in culture, human cells. You can grow mouse cells in a petri dish. We can then transform those cells, get them to take up DNA, and grow up those transformed cells. So embryonic cells, remember, they can be anything. Embryonic cells, full of potential, they can be anything. We get our gene into them, and then, we reintroduce those cells into a new embryo. We add those transformed cells back into a new embryo. That embryo grows into a baby. We have a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of those babies, but they're mosaic. And by that I mean these transformed cells only give rise to part of the baby, randomly. Part of its liver and part of its kidney and part of its skin and part of its foot. And part of its gametes. Some of the gametes from some of these mosaics will carry our transgene. Some of the gametes from some of the mosaics will have our transgene, and when we cross these together, will end up with some of the babies will be homozygous. Some of the babies will be homozygous for our transgene. And one of the most fun transgenes that people work with these days is GFP. Green fluorescence protein. It's a protein from jellyfish. And it makes mice glow green. So these babies, the green ones, are the ones that are homozygous, the ones that are expressing the transgene. And their litter mates here that are not green um, do not. So these are called reporter genes. They, they report their presence in offspring, usually by color, light of some kind. GFP is a really dramatic example. If you have time to kill sometime, just do a search for GFP animals, and you'll see monkeys and rabbits and mice and rats and all kinds of um, This middle organism, this is obviously um, an animal embryo. It's expressing this blue stuff. That's actually a bacterial gene 
from the lac operon. Lac Z from the lac operon is creating this blue color in an animal. Okay, we're, this is a bacterial gene being expressed in an animal and creating color. Fireflies glow. They don't actually glow. They bioluminesce. Fireflies create light from biochemistry. The enzyme that they use is called luciferase. We can put luciferase from firefly into tobacco and make it bioluminesce. Bioluminescent plants exist. Bioluminescent plants exist. Green monkeys exist. A little while ago, there was a Kickstarter campaign for someone who wanted to make solar-powered bioluminescent plants who would absorb solar energy in the daytime and then glow at night. Like for golf greens, so you could play golf at night. Or, I don't know, like trees along your street glowing at night, so you wouldn't need street lights. That's, that's crazy stuff. But it's a stupid idea, right? Like you, no one wants glowing trees. No, the ecosystem does not want glowing trees. We just have to be so careful. We are a relatively smart species, but we have to be careful. Um, <clears throat> coming back to this, the brain and how the brain works is one of the frontiers of biology research. And this technique is just so incredibly powerful to be turning on and off specific neurons and seeing their effect in a living animal is tremendously powerful. And again, I keep coming back in the context of our course, how do you do this? How do you get expression of channel rhodopsin, but only in specific neurons? Idea? How? So we've talked a little bit about how to get genes into animals and plants, but how do you get that gene expressed only in a particular spot? How do you get this gene expressed in a spot? Yes? Good call. Except we can't very well put genes next to anything. We don't have really great ability to control where the DNA goes. So what's the... If we can't put the gene beside the element, a great critical thinking, creative thinking strategy is to invert things, put the element beside the gene. So yes, we can grab that hormone response element, we can grab the control. Grab the control, let me back up a step. If we can find a gene that is expressed in the tissue that we want, at the time that we want, we can grab the control from that gene and put it on ours. Grab the control that we know works where we want it to be, and then we can put that control on our gene, and then our gene will get expressed only where we want it to be. Beautiful. So that's a really important idea. We're not just putting in naked trans genes and saying, good luck. We're putting them under the control of elements that ensure their expression properly. But it's very, very difficult to target where the genes go in the genome. Now in the rats, what we were able to do is use a viral vector that only infects the neurons that we're after. So that's another way. You could have regulation on the gene that's tissue specific, 
or you could have a vector that's tissue specific. So this looks a little complicated. It's just amazing. So this is a construct that was used to make an opto rat. The purple things are um, terminal repeats. Just all you need to know about that is that they're involved in recombination events that get this sequence inserted into the host genome. They're recombination sites. This green thing is a promoter from a gene called EF1 alpha, which is an elongation factor in translation. We did not talk about this in this course. But you need lots of it. Translation, you need lots of translation. You need lots of EF1 alpha. That means the promoter is very strong. Promoter is very strong. So you have a very strong promoter in this construct. And then there's channel rhodopsin, CHR, fused, fused with YFP, yellow fluorescent protein instead of green. So this is going to be our marker to ensure that this gene is in the neurons. We'll be able to see them glow yellow. And then look at this red thing. This is an element that prolongs the life of mRNA. It's a three prime a three prime UTR element that prolongs the life of mRNA. And that, of course, would increase the expression of the gene. So we've got this strong promoter driving channel rhodopsin, and we've got this element here that extends the life of mRNA, so we get even more channel rhodopsin. This red element comes from a woodchuck. It, it actually, like woodchucks are these little rodent, cat-sized rodents. Some of you have seen them. It's actually a woodchuck virus. This, this element comes from a woodchuck virus. I don't think you're surprised to hear that viruses have lots of tricks for strong expression. Viruses often have to express their genes very quickly, very strongly. Many of our best gene expression elements we've stolen from viruses, and this is one of them. But this is a gene that we're trying to put into a eukaryote. It needs a poly A signal, and we've got that from the human growth hormone, just because it's handy. You can buy all of this stuff from a catalog and put it together to make your own construct and then put it into a vector and deliver it into the brains of mice. And it works. Like, this is a zoo. Who knows where the EF1 came from, but channel rhodopsin came from clammy. YFP came from a jellyfish. This is a woodchuck virus. This is a human. This is a whole zoo of sequences put into yet another animal, a rat, and it works. It gets incorporated into their genome, and this thing gets expressed. And not only is it expressed, it's functional. When you shine blue light in the brain of the rat, Neurons depolarize, and the rat's behavior is affected. We're going to continue with these kinds of stories um, next, next day. Crazy stuff that we're able to do. And you can think about whether that's interesting to you, whether you might want to be one of those crazy people um, or not. But in the meantime, have a great weekend. Make good choices and do not work on the GSA. Do not.